graduation from high school. It's an important milestone in a student's life. It's a rite of passage from childhood to adulthood, and it signals the beginning of a new chapter in a young person's life. The class of 1996 at Sauhegan High School in Amherst, New Hampshire, was a unique one in many ways. But most notably, they were an inclusive community of learners, a group dedicated not only to excellence, but to equity and inclusion for all students, including those with significant disabilities. A lot's been written about you seniors, particularly it seems in the last week, and about your exploits over the past four years. I think the bottom line, though, is that you have established a set of standards for future classes that will be very tough to match. I must tell all of you and your parents and your friends and your relatives who are here that you are the most awesome class I've known in my 22 years as a school administrator. I think we all know that, that sitting in front of us today are some of the most powerful scholars, athletes, artists, dramatists, singers, some of the most creative talents in the state of New Hampshire and in this country. And sitting in front of us are people who also contributed 10,000 hours or more of community service. This is a very special group and I'm tremendously proud of them. Amro Saleh Diab. Many schools across the United States are including students with disabilities in the mainstream of general education. And many more are implementing a wide variety of general education reforms. But there are only a handful of schools, like Sauhegan, that are on the cutting edge, embracing both challenges. As we shot this video during the last month of the 1995-96 school year, we were witness to the principles and practices working together in powerful yet subtle ways that are essential to Sauhegan's mission. Undergirding all of Sauhegan's efforts is a mission statement that's not only emblazoned on the school walls, but actually guides everyday practice. To create a community of learners, born of trust, respect, and courage, where each student's talents are nurtured and honored. How do you create an environment where all children can excel? All children, not some children, or most of the children, but all of the children. Every child is so important, so unique, that to do anything less is a travesty. It's a simple view, not complicated. Uh, it's nice that the research supports it, but I think even if the research didn't support it, I wouldn't care, because essentially schools need to be places where uh, every child is respected for what he or she uh, can do, and worked with to raise that child's level of uh, performance as high as we possibly can before we let them out into the, into the cruel world where uh, they're not going to have our support. Uh, they're going to have to fend for themselves. Let's give them the skills to fend for themselves and I think more importantly than anything, the belief in themselves that they can be successful. You do that, I go home happy. The, the, the mission statement. The mission statement. We got yeah. a mission statement. Freshman year, we have to read the mission statement yeah, like all the time. Yeah, dissect it and uh, break it apart. Yeah, but now it's now. Can you, it's, can you tell me what the mission statement is off your head? Uh, as a community, we aspire. No, we're a um, built of learners. Yeah. To aspire. Like, yeah. To learn and engage, respect our school. Respect and don't lie. Yeah, that's that's the gist of it. You know, be a good kid. I don't memorize it, but I know what it's about. Yeah. Sauhegan High is located in an archetypal small New England community. Characterized by colonial architecture and a picturesque village green, the population holds the fiercely independent view of local control over education, 
epitomized by the state motto, live free or die. When the town of Amherst decided to build a new high school because of overcrowding in the nearby regional high school, the philosophy of inclusion wasn't an add-on. It was considered an integral part of the school's mission. When we first opened here at Sahegan High School, uh, we were deeply committed to inclusion. And it, it may seem trite, but it, it really generates from the belief that all kids can learn. It's that simple. Um, I think w what's happened over the past five years is that the commitment has remained steadfast. Uh, but we've become more realistic about how difficult it is to really ensure that heterogeneity works in every classroom. So what we found is that through lots of staff development efforts, we've tried to get teachers up to speed uh, so that, in fact, they would challenge all kids. And the real trick to heterogeneous grouping is to ensure that you can challenge a whole range of kids in every classroom. And that's hard work for teachers. And uh, for teachers to acquire those skills, they need to work on it. And working together collaboratively is, is the way we've found uh, that it's best. And if we can get some good resources in to help support teachers, then, then it ultimately uh, can be effective and, and can work for everybody. But mission statements and policies only have meaning if they have an effect on students' lives. Perhaps no one student exemplifies the impact of Sauhegan's mission statement better than Amro Diab. For the first eight years of his public school career, Amro was placed in self-contained classrooms in a school outside of the Amherst School District. Just prior to Sauhegan's opening, he and several other students with significant disabilities were transitioned back to Sauhegan. They became a part of the class of 1996 and were enrolled in heterogeneous mainstream classes. Uh, Debbie, when you see me project this, she knows. Okay. He worked in the school store during his free periods and for several summers held a job alongside one of his classmates. Is that it? Yeah. Camera. One of those is Red out. Red camera. Which one? Our blend? Um, the raspberry. Raspberry? Okay. Camera, can you go take chocolate raspberry down to uh, browser? What? Huh? I just can't get it. Muffins, we have chocolate chip, blueberry, cinnamon, and apple spice. Get some more coffee. Yeah, I'm going. Thanks. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You gotta slow down. Tomorrow. Yeah. 12 o'clock, you gotta be home. We are going to Thai. You're going to the Thai store? Or what? Pick up some tucks, right? Oh, all right. Good, yeah. good. <laughs> Going here. Period three? Next Thursday. I mean, tomorrow. Today. When? Talk to me. You can't. Friday. I know, Friday. I know that. You told me. Do you think it's good that Amro was made? Oh, I think it's great. I think it's awesome for him, especially because he gets to be with us. He's not walking down a different hallway looking at us, wondering what it's like to be us. So he's right with us. He's doing the same things we're doing. Uh, he played on the football team with us. He's, you know, I worked with him a regular outside of school job and, and I think the school leads to that because he feels comfortable with us he's getting the same education we are and he feels like one of us he feels like one of the guys he, he is one of the guys in any school of 800 students there will be those who struggle to learn who struggle to fit in and find their unique place so Higgins commitment is to stay the course with those students to acknowledge problems, but to persist in finding the right combination of supports and strategies that will work for each student. At 
Sauhegan, every student is valued and has a voice. This commitment to social justice and democratic governance means students and faculty must wrestle with daily decisions about curriculum, discipline, grading, and even the hiring of new faculty, who themselves represent diverse philosophies. It looked right at me, and I asked myself in that moment, it's what Gandhi called satyagraha, that sort of moral force. Um, I asked myself, why am I doing this? In their senior seminar class, students struggle with difficult questions about human behavior and social responsibility. They not only study historical figures who've made a difference by taking a controversial stand, but they hear from their teachers who are involved in social activism. Do you think that, I don't know, this is for anybody, do you think that people do these things that make a difference um, and do them because they're completely selfless or because it accomplishes something for them. Because it just seems to me that every person who does all this stuff is for themselves as much as it is for somebody else. That's a really interesting question. I don't know if you've ever read Anne Rand, but she would say that no one that selflessness is a very bad thing and that no there is not no such thing as total true altruism. And in a way I agree with that. I think that everyone does things that in some cases might seem like a real sacrifice, and yet there's always some element of gain for that person. It might not be that you're calculatedly doing something, you know, but there is, and there has to be. You know, otherwise, your worth as a human being because of nothing, I don't think, I don't know. I, so I think that that is a really interesting question. I was wondering if somebody would ask it, yeah. It's so much more freedom, and like so much more, teachers are always your friends. You get a lot more respect in some ways, and in other ways, it's, I don't know, it's really different than a lot of the other high schools, because, like, the teachers don't lecture you, but they talk with you. Like, you have discussions instead of, like, being talked at, which, like, keeps my attention. Maintaining school reform is decidedly difficult while coping with the day-to-day -day tasks of teaching and running a school. So since its doors opened in 1992, Sauhegan administrators have recognized the importance of association with a variety of outside organizations and individuals who act as critical friends to the school. Are they bad? No, they're really good kids. They're kids learning to be teachers. From 1992 through 1996, Cheryl Jorgensen, a faculty member with the University of New Hampshire's Institute on Disability, served as a critical friend to Sauhegan. A critical friend is an outsider on the inside, somebody who is definitely outside the system, but who spends enough time in the school, not just in meetings, not just planning, but somebody who is up close and personal with teachers and kids in classrooms. Um, to know not only what's going on on the surface of the school, but somebody who can sense um, the underlying forces that are at work in that school. So a critical friend to a school spends a lot of time there, um, not only works with administrators, but with teachers, students, parents, the whole school community, um, to provide a sounding board for people around difficult educational questions to ask difficult questions um, and to um, sort of start conversations. And I think that was my role. Some people wonder if there's always a need for an outsider. You know, I, I'm frequently asked, gee, can't we serve as our own critical friends? And I think I'd answer that, I'd say yes and no. Yes and no is the answer to that question. Um, I always think that a school will need um, a somewhat impartial outsider, someone who's not so embroiled in the day-to-day -day, the day-to-day -day business of teaching that they can see the bigger picture. What Sauhegan has done is take that the next step and establish within their school, with their own teachers and administrators, small groups of their own internal critical friends. So they're reflecting on their own practice um, as a part of what they do as teachers. 
With guidance from the Coalition of Essential Schools, Sauhegan teachers learn techniques for working together to provide constructive criticism and reflection for one another on issues such as ideas for interdisciplinary curriculum units, and in this scene, a proposed requirement for all students to assemble an end of 10th grade portfolio. So I guess what we really want you to focus on today is questions that are on the board. Um, how can we make this more user-friendly to sophomores? Um, and then the second one really could have A, B, C, D, E. In other words, is it reflective of the work students do at Division I? A couple things in, um, specifically we'd like you to take a look at. Is technology represented well or well enough? I, I think that there's no question that students can use technology in order to meet some of these outcomes. There's no question about that. Whether or not that needs to be more spelled out, I'm wondering. So. It would be a really powerful statement to not have it be a heading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But to, in examples, you know, have it come out through that, whether it's, you know, in, you know, word processing or database or... So I think it's a theoretical, you know, philosophical conversation. My feeling is that if the kid experiences this, that he or she would not, will not be able to escape collaborating or technology. I mean, you just can't escape it, you know? So having, you know, the desire to have it a, a separate category, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think they're, they're embedded in, in, in each of the outcomes. Any other final? No, thank you very much. Yeah. Really good feedback. We're, like We're getting there. What are we doing next week? <laughs> Overall, Sohegan has been like a really good experience, but um, it's been very hard because we kind of like guinea pigs here. Whereas every single year, it's been something different, and um, like freshman and sophomore year was awesome here because we really they pounded into our heads the coalition uh, theories and everything. Then kind of like our junior and senior year, everything's been changing, different teachers and. Uh, kind of like the coalition, the theories are kind of coming down because reality is kind of set. Teachers at Sauhegan have come to see their roles as very different from their colleagues at traditional high schools. Teaching in a closed-door classroom by oneself is out of the question. The faculty utilize the support of their colleagues on a daily basis as they plan curriculum, evaluate student work, and make the myriad of decisions that fall to them. The change is all the more dramatic for special education teachers, who are usually among the most isolated in a school. Take a walk for a second. Most times sequestered in a resource room or self-contained classroom. Mary Young was wary about the changes in her role as a special education teacher. I was very skeptical about coming here because I couldn't really quite figure out what I was going to be doing all day long without having all these lessons and these, this teaching to prepare for. When I got here, I realized I was an integral piece of a four-man team. I was actually the fifth person on that team. And it was an absolute delight to work with 87 students instead of having a caseload of about 22 special ed students. At Sauhegan, it's not sufficient for them to be experts for a small percentage of the student population. All students are fully a part of the mainstream of general education classes. There are no classes or programs just for students with disabilities. The role of the special education person in a school like Sauhegan High School it has to be unique from what we are accustomed to in special education. We are, we are not in a position any longer of, of having that great black dividing line down the middle of the classroom and the classroom teacher saying, these are my kids and these are your kids and take them away. And, and in fact, then the classroom teacher never lays eyes on that special ed teacher again, or rarely does. Or they pass in the hallway and say, how's it going? Fine. How are you? Fine. End of discussion. There are, evaluation. there are some basic criteria we look for in this sort of okay. new special educator. So One is a much more extensive, extensive knowledge of general <laughs> curriculum. And it isn't just like for the LD kid, the low-level kid, <laughs> the MR kid, the EH kid. It also needs to look at or their techniques need to be applicable to the high-end kid. 
-hmm. So we're looking at a kind of a generic support person. Cuts. Inherently different than, than what we are asking or have been asking special ed teachers to do in the past. Other things that are different from, well, we don't have bells. No, we I'm don't. chewing gum. And I'm wearing a hat. Um, we don't have to ask to go to the bathroom. We, I don't know. I'm leaving class right now without even asking because, um, well, we're having a party. <laughs> I guess that's different too. Why do they trust us so much? Well, for one thing, they trust us from the beginning. And, um, well, hmm. That's a good question. Because they have no reason not to trust us. In a traditional eight-period day, teachers find little time to collaborate. Their instructional methods are limited mostly to lecture, and measuring the performance of students is often limited to multiple-choice tests and essays, ineffective means for students to show what they know. In Sauhegan's ninth and 10th grades, the schedule is built so that teams of teachers are able to collaborate with one another each and every day. During long teaching blocks in the morning and after lunch, teachers divide the time according to what is needed for that particular day. The need for innovative scheduling, which gives teachers longer class periods and opportunities to plan during the day, can make or break the most well-conceived educational reform. Superintendent Lally doesn't buy the excuse of some administrators that there's not enough time for this kind of planning. Well, time can always be thrown up as an excuse for not accomplishing uh, reform. One way in which Suhegan and any other high school uh, can be seen as being on the same plane is we have the same time that other high schools have. We're equal there. We have no advantage. It's how we structure that time that can make the difference, that can provide the planning time. It's how we have teams of teachers uh, working with uh, teams of students at the ninth and 10th grade level. It's that scheduling uh, method that allows time to be created. Well, any high school can do the same thing within the confines of their day, just as we have within our day, they can create time. Imagine a high school of 750 students where each takes the same English, social studies, science, and math classes, where honors challenges, established as a contract between a student and a teacher, are an option for any student within each major class project. Sauhegan's decision not to track and to group classes heterogeneously sent a signal that all students would be held to high expectations within a common core curriculum. Studies on tracking and ability grouping consistently show little benefit to academically talented students. They also indicate a detrimental effect on lower track students. Even so, few schools have totally eliminated ability grouping. Tracking remains a controversial issue. The community concerns about heterogeneous grouping seem always to derive from the parents of the quote-unquote most able kids, the, uh, the prospective honors kids. And I've heard this for 20 years as I've attempted to untrack schools everywhere that I've been. Uh, I, I believe, and I think our staff believes, very strongly the tracking is wrong uh, and that, uh, homo that heterogeneous grouping can work to the benefit of all kids. The, the other concern we've heard from the community uh, is just around the idea of, of will mixed ability classes um, create a, a lowest common denominator type phenomenon? Are, are we going to end up with um, the teacher always shooting to the lowest level because kids are struggling with it. You know, I don't get it. You know, I don't get this math stuff. Uh, so the other kids are hemming and hawing while the, the less able kid gets ex extra support. Uh, I think what we had to do was show them very clearly that this was not going to happen. That in fact, we were going to aim for high standards for all kids. I mean, the bottom line is you want to shoot for high standards for all kids. In insist that they, they make it. Uh, insist that support is provided by the school, by the teacher within the classroom. And ultimately, that's the way heterogeneous grouping is going to be effective. We have 
everybody in class, like all the smart and all the dumb people are all together, which is probably a bad thing to say. <laughs> we but don't have true. tracking. Yeah, we don't have tracking. And everybody, it's, it's just everybody's really friendly. We have Everyone's a really good attitude welcome. here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we all get along. Yeah. It's cool. Pretty much. Sauhegan students are among the most academically talented in New Hampshire. Their SAT scores and other academic honors rank them at or near the top of all the state's graduating seniors. But what sets the school apart is its focus on students who aren't traditionally successful. It's a pretty cool place to go to school. You know, the kids are great. Um, it is. I'd rather go to the school than we're better more than any other school that I've been to. But, um, I have a reasonable amount of friends, not that many. But it's no big deal. The use of heterogeneous grouping, along with high academic standards, forces the need for a curriculum design process that accommodates student differences. Differences in skill, in interest, in motivation, and in past experiences. One of the things I love best about Sauhegan is this piece that's in our mission statement about passion. We each have passions. It's through passion that we engage with the world and, and grow personal knowledge. We can engage virtually every passion one way or another, and that, I think, is very powerful. Um, what one thing it means is letting go of the curriculum a little bit. And we, we've ta had some conversations um, about how the curriculum is, is a centering force. It's a safe place. It's a place everybody knows exists. So where do you find your balance if curriculum is not the given? And, and I think that's something we've struggled with here at Sauhegan. We're four years into this. And our curriculum, while we can give you an overall framework, still has some shifting pieces to it. And for some people, that, that just feels uncomfortable, and it's time to say, give me solid ground to stand on. So in such an environment, what becomes your solid ground? What becomes your centering point? For me, it's a question. How does this impact on student learning? But what you need to answer as a group is how did the end of World War I, in other words, the Treaty of Versailles, lead to World War II. Does that make sense to everybody? The reality of the day to day, I think, is that um, the ideas happen when you're driving into school or in the shower. You know, it doesn't happen as we all sit down at tables and say, let's, let's play in curriculum. So I think it really involves a great amount of flexibility when we sit down to, to, to talk about work that we're going to be planning for kids. Um, we have adopted a certain protocol for it, which centers around um, the essential questions that we're going to be using and the exhibitions that we're going to be asking kids to do. Um, and to me, it's imperative that the skills then that we work on are the skills needed for the exhibition. And the content is almost a need-to-know basis, that, that you work on the skills and content that you need to, to successfully complete the exhibition. So he and dean of faculty, Allison Rao, is on the front lines with teachers every day, helping them organize a curriculum that's very different from what's usually reflected in typical high school textbooks. The, the curriculum planning process itself is not a linear process. It implies a constant loop of answering the questions of what you want the kids to know, what you want them to be able to do, what are the questions that should drive that learning, what are the resources you will need? What are the assessments you need to do so that you're discovering as you go and the student is discovering what it is they need to do next? And that's a very messy process. It's, um, it can look chaotic at times, but if you stick with it as we have, we find that the students begin to understand themselves as learners, begin to be able to develop their own questions, begin to be able to answer the question themselves, what should I know, what do I need to do in order to learn this, what, what kind of help do I need, what kind of support, and can begin to um, become independent learners, which is what it's really all about. Hey, pal! As each new graduating class readies for its senior prom, 
Sauhegan will have new challenges to face. To assure the philosophy of inclusion keeps all students not only in the mainstream, but fully participating and learning what will be important for their own unique futures. To keep the fires of innovation alive without burning out their teachers. To keep the community involved as active partners in the school. And finally, to remember that celebrating diversity is ultimately in everyone's self-interest. We all need to belong in order to become our own personal best. Okay, the moment we have all been waiting for.